In this video, we've got a two for one special, with the first part being starting to get the engine out of smoky red for a complete new engine, which includes pulling the hood off and operating some heavy machinery. We've also got after that a Cat C7 in a motorhome with an electrical problem that ends up being not what I was expecting. So this is the 6NZ C15 out of Smoky Red, or I should say it's in Smoky Red, but they've decided to go with a complete new engine, which can't really fault them for. Now a lot of people were saying that I should have just repaired it, and they could do that. However, the problem with the gear problems is they're very expensive to fix. The gears themselves are very expensive. We've also got damage to the crankshaft, possibly damage to the camshaft, so I think it is smart for them to go with a new engine. Now there are many little problems you always end up finding like this. I'm not sure if that's actually a crack or if the clamp is digging in there. I'm gonna guess that's a crack, but just you always run into stuff like this when you're taking apart engines or removing them. Just things that you find over time like this. There's two jacket water heater cords. One's actually melted off and then they ran a new one to it. Oil pan's already been removed, remember, because we were inspecting the rod bearings in the previous video. Got to take off the power steering reservoir, whole bunch of hoses, AC lines. We're going to pull the hood, the radiator, cooling package, bunch of wires, your fuel lines. You've got this green wire, too, which is a little weird. You've got your boost air line to the dash. And this green wire, I was, I was like, what is going on here? And sometimes you don't know what, why someone did something when they did it, so... If you look at this wire, it has the weirdest routing for seemingly no reason. It starts against the engine, it then goes, wraps around this hose, which is the fuel return hose off the back of the head. It then wraps up and through the harness again, and it's got three butt connectors, but it's all for one wire, so I'm not sure why they do that. I'm sure whoever did it had a reason for it, but it just, you find stuff like this all the time when you're in the repair industry, just kind of funny. Now we need to, first thing we need to do is get the hood off. And the worst part of that is this has these two bolts and it's got this slotted cage. The bolt is supposed to stay so it doesn't turn, but it does turn. <coughs> Luckily, we were able to get it by wedging a wrench against the head. It was pretty tight, but we were able to get that bolt off. The other ones came off no problem. And me and this assistant here are trying to get the hood off. Now, I hate pulling hoods because they're never perfectly balanced. We've got a pallet under this. You can see I've got a box to protect the hood from it contacting the forks. And this is called a Namco. I'm not sure how old this thing is, but it's a, basically it's a stand-up electric forklift, meaning you stand on it, don't sit. It doesn't have a brake pedal. It doesn't have a horn. It works. It'll, it says it's rated for about 2,000 pounds lifting capacity. It's very loud, like when you're raising it or lowering it or moving it, just the electric motor is very loud. But it works pretty good. It is kind of weird too, because it'll never just stop when you take your uh, like forward or reverse. It just kind of drifts for a little while longer. But like I said, there's no brake. There's no parking brake either. It's it's a weird machine, but it works good for the shop where we're, we're level. Wouldn't want to take this outside, that's for sure. Now, I'm gonna put this hood here. Like I said, it's on a pallet in the shop. I've lifted hoods with the crane before. There's really no good pick points on most hoods either, so they can be quite a pain to move around. But I don't like, some guys like leaving them outside. I do not, we had a truck once. Luckily, I didn't do this, but I was the lead in the shop where this happened. We had put a hood outside and they had a windstorm. This hood was on a very nice truck. It ended up tipping over and then just, the wind pushed it about 40 feet over uh, the asphalt and just really messed up this hood. It costs thousands of dollars to fix. So I like to leave them inside if at all possible. Luckily we have the room for it currently, although it's pretty tight quarters in here as you can see. I'm gonna park the Namco over here and basically this was on Friday afternoon so this was about as far as we got on this day. But I do have the RV repair which is a little more troubleshooting and electrical technically related so let's do some destruction of the week before that though.
This week's destruction of the week comes from Dylan, and Dylan sent us this 5.9 Cummins part picture. You know what it is? It's a rod bearing. Well, it's what is supposed to be a rod bearing at least, and the reason it looks like that is, well, the engine has some problems, like this piston. I say, and I don't really see anything wrong with it, except it's actually snapped in half. You can see a crack all the way across the face of that piston. Don't see that very often. Made some extra holes in the engine for ventilation. This was the journal on the crankshaft where that rod bearing was supposed to be. And here's the other side of the engine. You can see the camshaft might be okay, but yeah. Feel sorry for this little Cummins. Thank you, Dylan, for sending the pictures. Let's go look at that motorhome. Hey guys, Josh with the Update Channel, and you might be wondering, why am I in a bedroom? There's a bed over there, got a computer, hallway, bathroom. Well, I'm not in a bedroom, I'm actually, well, it is a bedroom, but I'm in a motorhome, an RV, Freightliner one, and it's got a cat engine in it, and it is here for an intermittent check engine light. Now, you might be wondering, why aren't you doing a bunch of engine work? I want to see pistons and cylinder heads. Well, not every job I do is a bunch of engine work. Some of it is intermittent electrical, which I actually like doing, but... Not everyone does, and not everyone likes RVs. I don't mind working on them, though. So what we've got is an intermittent fuel pressure sensor fault, which fuel pressure sensors on C7s were somewhat rare. Most of them do not have them, but some do. So this one looks like it has a code for it, but also going to look at getting into a possible re-rate on this. So let's see if we can re-rate it first, and then we'll go about troubleshooting the check engine light. So you can see we're actually over the engine compartment, which on most motorhomes is the bed. And usually I try to connect to the front but this one i could not find a data link plug plug up front so i was going by the rear luckily i was able to run the cord from the back of the engine through the window here and the first thing we're saying they wanted to see if there's a possible re-rate this is a motorhome and this one was rated at 330 so we're in the cat re-rate sheet here and yes there's a 350 horsepower rating available same torque is it really worth 20 horsepower for the added cost? That's really up to the customer, but this is an early KAL, and early KALs could have the old injectors in them still, and if they do, you can't re-rate it to the higher horsepower because you can only re-rate it with the correct injectors. And there's not an easy way to tell what injectors there are in there unless you pull the valve cover. There are ways, though. We'll discuss that in a little bit. So what we wanted to do is see the interlock code. Is it a 51? It is a 51, which means you could go to a 52, and a 52 means it should have the newer injectors in that. Now I say should because we need to verify what injectors are in it, and what we did is we took the injector trim file number and broke down the file for it, and it sure as heck has the updated injectors. Customer opted not to do a re-rate, but one thing I noticed while looking at the codes was, you notice the KAL serial number? It's in lowercase. Cat never puts them in lowercase, which means someone has most likely either replaced the CCM or reprogrammed it. Now, when I see the serial number in lowercase, that's a pet peeve of mine because it's supposed to be in uppercase. And notice it has this fuel pressure voltage high. Apparently, they'd taken to a Freightliner dealer and they'd said, oh, yeah, you need a new fuel pressure sensor. So it's like, well, we need to look at that before we verify. It also has this boost pressure not responding. A J19 device not responding is fairly common and not really something you can usually fix so primarily we want to take care of the fuel pressure one first and then if we want to look at the boost pressure sensor so fuel pressure 92 psi unlikely with the engine off so we need to look and find our fuel pressure sensor and see if we've got a fuel pressure sensor problem a wiring problem or maybe something else now this being a motorhome some people hate working on motorhomes i actually don't mind working on them but we're going to be going here under the bed to get to the engine. And one good thing about motorhomes is usually the back of the cylinder head is an easy place to get to. And that's good because the fuel pressure sensor is almost always on the back of the cylinder head on a C7 if it has a fuel pressure sensor. So what I'm using here is this is actually a hood prop and it's adjustable. I use these all the time. I've got two of them for RVs. They're really great for holding up things like this that weigh definitely in the probably 25 to 50 pound range because you definitely don't want to rely on the rams which this one doesn't even have to hold them up so i use that hood prop on the heavier ones i'll use two of them and it has yet to fail me so we have our c7 here pretty looks like it's in pretty good shape it's just low mileage on this one too i think it was less than 30,000 miles 
So what we're looking at here is the back of our cylinder head. And there's two potential places here and then on the fuel pressure regulator for where the fuel pressure sensor would be if it has one. Now, someone could have added one to the secondary filter housing or somewhere on the line, but that would be unusual. That's your pressure regulator, by the way, if you ever have to change it on a C7 or a 3126 coming off the back of the cylinder head. So I don't see a sensor. I don't see the wiring for it. So at this point, I think I know what happened. Someone programmed the ECM, did not set it to not installed for the fuel pressure sensor, and then put it on its way. So I went chasing the, the hoses for where the secondary fuel filter would be. And this is what I found. You can see the fuel water separator there, but this looped line with the union in it is actually your fuel line coming off the Huey pump or the fuel transfer pump, I should say, back to the cylinder head. And then, yeah, it ends in the head. Why someone did that, I'm not sure. It probably had a normal secondary fuel filter at one time and someone took it off. I don't know why you'd want to do that. That is not good for the injectors, but that is just how it is. Yeah, you can see those lines there. You can trace them to the back. So yeah, this does not even have a fuel pressure sensor, but it's got the code for it because it is showing installed in the ECM. So what we're going to do is we're gonna go in and fix that problem. So we can go into our configuration, fuel pressure sensor shows installed. There is none on this engine. So this is gonna fix that problem not installed. Now, that's not gonna fix the boost pressure not responding fault. That can be pretty complicated. Ended up looking at the engine kind of quickly, checking the air filter and stuff. Customer did not want to down the RV. So we didn't actually end up troubleshooting that one very in-depthly. We could have, but they didn't, like I said, they didn't want to down it. So did take care of that constant fuel pressure fault though. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.